I have received a letter from the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the Prime Minister's failure to deliver in his first year of office. I call upon those honourable members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places. And I call the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank you. What a busy week it's been, and it's only Tuesday. <laughs> cabinet, cabinet leaks directly defying the Prime Minister's orders, a public split in the Liberal Party room, the Liberal Party room now a live blog site for different factions of the Liberal Party, <laughs> the extreme right wing calling the shots, the member for Warringah airing his views to all and sundry about all and sundry, and a parliament in chaos. A government Senate with no business to do. The last time we met, they couldn't wait to go home, and now they're here, they've got nothing to do. This is a government in chaos. So let me correct myself. This is business as usual, another week in the busy life of the Turnbull government. Let's cast our minds back to a year ago, those fateful the fateful September the 14th. It was the beginning of new politics, and our friend the Prime Minister said it would be the end of slogans. The future was here. It was the second coming of the Sun King. We were going to see the heroic mould of individual leadership shining brightly like a lone star over this benighted Liberal government, and we were going to be rescued. We are going to be rescued by none other than Malcolm Turnbull, Prime Minister. Of course, we were told by some of his boosters and indeed some in the media that this was a marvellous development for democracy. No longer would we need the outmoded two-party system. We had the Turnbull party system. And what a year it's been since then. I concede there has never been a more exciting time to be Malcolm Turnbull. But the, unfortunately the for the, of the for opposition the, will refer to members for the by member their for correct Wentworth, titles. the Prime Minister, the Sun King, the man who invented the internet. Anyway. A year later, a year later. I, I want the leader is, of the opposition to be able to use his entire ten minutes without me pulling him up. Thank you. Yeah. I'd me too. Um, a year later. Well, you know the answer. A year later, this prime minister is the great national disappointment. From messiah to mediocrity, from agile to fragile. Never before has a prime minister promised so much and delivered so little. He claims in a remarkable statement that this has been a substantial year of achievement, but in fact it has been marked by dithering, by delay, by dysfunction and by disunity. It has been a year marked by cowardly retreats, by the betrayal of everything the old member for Wentworth pretended to care about. It has been a year of weakness, not strength. It has been a year of moral cowardice, not leadership. A year when, at every turn on every issue, the Prime Minister has allowed himself to be bullied by the right wingers in his backbench. And the only promise this Prime Minister had to be able to say that he could lead his party and unite his party is that he would deliver a massive electoral mandate to the government. Oh, yeah. That was, in the first 10 months of his government, that was the promise which even the most optimistic Turnbull boosters hung on to, that, that he would deliver that electoral dividend, which would mean that he would at last be able to stamp his authority on the party. But that did not happen. There are 17 less coalition members sitting on that side of the bench, on that side of the parliament, because of this Prime Minister. A Prime Minister to whom no one in his government owes anything. Authority is not granted by the title. Authority is granted by the ability to deliver. We on this side understand very bitterly that the government won the election, but we also recognise a wounded, a weak and an, a, a leader with no agenda, no authority and just waiting for the next mistake. And every time his backbench have demanded more and more of him, he's caved in. He surrenders. He, he surrenders on every issue that he's ever said he believes in. On climate change, once a heroic figure who would cross the floor, now he is letting the climate sceptics write his climate change policy. But at least he's in charge, he says. On marriage equality, 
in the month before he rolled Tony Abbott, the member for Warringah, he said that he believed a free vote in parliament was the best way to go. He knows it's the best way to go. Why are we led by a man who will, when knowing the best option, recommend to Australians a second best option? That is moral cowardice. And he can claim all of his mandate for plebiscite. We understand that he knows that if he was actually in charge of his party, he wouldn't be having this plebiscite. So we are presented, Australians are presented with a leader claiming to lead the country when he cannot lead his own party in the way which his own conscience demands he should. But we've also seen him on superannuation, a matter very important to millions and millions of Australians. The changes that these vandals opposite, the Treasurer and the Prime Minister, made in their rush, in the budget, in their agendaless government at the last budget, has undermined critically the confidence of every Australian in superannuation investments. Now, I acknowledge we have to rein in the excessive concessions at the top, but the way this ham-fisted government went about their business, they've created a question mark in the minds of millions of superannuants. Why do we even bother doing this? It takes some going to trash the superannuation system. And then he says he's got an absolutely ironclad policy, but then he uses his weasel words in his weak retreat, and he's already explaining to people, well, I might have said that then, but I certainly can't say it now, and I'd better check with some of my backbench in case I can say what I said today, tomorrow. <laughs> and what does he always say when we, when, he, when we have these problems? I'm sure what he says to his few remaining desperate backers, well, he shrugs his shoulders and he says, well, what, what do you expect me to do? I'm only the Prime Minister. You must be realistic. You had unrealistic expectations of me. All I wanted was the job. And why do you ask me to do anything with the job? <laughs> but you don't have to take my word for it. The reviews are in. A year in, Michelle Grattan. Since the coup that installed Malcolm Turnbull, many Liberals are disappointed and surprised he's turned out so far, love your optimism, Michelle, so far, a mediocre Prime Minister. He struggles in adversity, anger on display, firing bullets of blame. His graceless election night performance was appalling. Andrew Bolt, not exactly a true believer. How bad is Malcolm Turnbull? Even he struggles to name one thing that he's achieved since becoming Prime Minister. The official list of achievements is so embarrassingly tiny that his staff have padded it with things stolen from Abbott's. Or what about that memorable exchange between Jeff Kennett and Andrew Bolt, which I concede I failed to watch. But I repeat, Bolt, can you name the achievements of the Turnbull government after one year in office? Kennett, not easily. Bolt, can you name one? I'm not asking as a trick question. I want him desperately to succeed, says Kennett. Bolt, that's right, but can you name one? Kennett, no, not at the moment. <laughs> but I think Michael Gordon summarised this government best by quoting Neil Young. It sort of starts off real slow and then fizzles out altogether. <laughs> a year ago when he launched his coup, Mr Turnbull, the Prime Minister, said ultimately about his predecessor, ultimately the Prime Minister has not been capable of providing the economic leadership of our nation needs. Let's look at his economic leadership in the fun 12 months. Plan A, a 15 per cent GST on everything, sends out our poor soldier Morrison and then abandons him and runs away. Plan, don't, don't ask poor, poor Premier Baird what he thinks about Malcolm Turnbull's spine. Plan B, which the Prime Minister called, with his characteristic trademark humility, a once-in-a-generation reform. Double taxation. Why didn't we all think of that? Because you need to be as clever as Mr Turnbull to come up with an idea absolutely as dumb as that idea. Now, of course, Plan C was a $50 billion giveaway for multinational companies. I must record when we went into the budget lockup on budget night and I saw uh, my shadow minister for finance, my shadow treasurer, they were surprised. They were stunned. They said, you'll never believe it. And I couldn't. $50 billion tax giveaway. Even Goldman Sachs says $30 billion of that will go overseas. The big banks will pay $7.5 billion less tax, profit to the bottom line. They want, to, they want to look after multinationals to send more profits overseas. We want stronger Medicare. They want to give the banks a tax cut, and we are determined that, they, that we seek justice and give them a banking royal commission. And indeed, when we look about the lack of conviction of this Prime Minister, what we have to look at is marriage equality. The idea that he will provide $7.5 billion to the no case and $7.5 million to the yes case to be supervised by five MPs and five citizens is an atrocious idea. It shows the retrofitting 
of a bad idea being reinforced by even less sound planning. This nation doesn't need to spend nearly $200 million of taxpayer money when we've got a budget repair situation requiring hard choices to spend this on a government opinion poll. That's all this plebiscite is. It's a government opinion poll. But even worse, this government needs leadership. This government and this nation needs leadership from the Prime Minister. We know the Prime Minister's heart is not in this plebiscite. He desperately wants the issue to go away. Our problem is that the consequences of Mr Turnbull's pursuit of power the leader of the will be damaged. The time has expired. I call the, the Leader of the Opposition's time has expired and I call the Minister for Urban Infrastructure. Mr Speaker, is there a more ludicrous spectacle? Is there a more ludicrous spectacle than a Leader of a later Labor Opposition having the temerity to criticise this side of the House when it comes to delivery? 